Good evening, everyone. Time for us to begin our evening worship service here at Midway. And again, if you're visiting with us, thank you for being with us. We'd like to get to know you before you leave. It might be about a minute or two ahead of schedule, but I was sitting there next to Paul and I said, whoops, it got quiet. It must mean it's time to get up. Or as I was getting up, you started talking again. Well, anyway, it is time now since I went through all of that. But I'm sure you've uh, paid attention to the uh, boards scrolling with the announcements and everything. But very quickly, let me mention the ones who are sick or, or recovering mentioned this morning. And certainly we will continue praying for these. Uh, Eulene Logan thankful is at home and recovering. Isabella Seegers, need to remember her, A.J. Wilkerson, Ron Maynard, Zachably Langham, and this morning I said he was the 17-year-old son of Heather Woods. That's Heather Hoods. I saw the S on the end and that threw me off. Anyway, it's Heather Hoods, friend. <laughs> Friends, what did I say now? <laughs> I'm going to give up. You know. <laughs> also remember Liam and Elizabeth Owen, who uh, are homesick. And uh, this was brought to my attention. I don't see her tonight, but it was good to see Carlene with us this morning after being away for a while uh, with illness. Let's continue to remember these. As far as events are concerned, uh, remember tonight after services, there will be the uh, uh, group meetings as we usually have on, uh, mon on the fourth uh, Sunday. Remember tomorrow the meal delivery, if you can help, be here by four o'clock. The men's Bible study at 6.30 tomorrow and ladies Bible class at 9.30 uh, on Thursday. And again, a reminder to the ladies, uh, you're encouraged to uh, bring note cards. If you didn't, it's too late. But to stay following tonight's service to write notes to our Ladies Day visitors, and that'll be a very nice gesture. And then ladies also who would like to have a copy of the CDs uh, from the Ladies Day please uh, sign the sheet in the back of the auditorium. Also remember that uh, anybody who uh, usually keep a blanket or a pillow or something in your favorite pew, if you haven't already, uh, those are on one of the back pews for you to get. Then this announcement uh, that I'm sure we will all enjoy hearing, there is food left from the ladies' day. Everyone is invited to stay after the worship services tonight. It is pork, nachos, and desserts. I'm sure we'll have a full house. If there are other things uh, before we leave tonight that needs to be brought to our attention that I haven't mentioned, uh, get that note to me and we'll make sure that that is made. And now we'll uh, enter into our worship. Good evening. Will you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, as we begin the worship service tonight, we're so thankful. We come, every one of us here, individuals thankful for what you've done for us in our lives. We're thankful for the health to be here tonight. And Father, we're thankful for blessings of life we take for granted so much. We're thankful for our congregation here. We're thankful for love we have for each other. And Father, we're thankful to be a Christian here today. We're thankful for all that you bless us with. Father, help us to look at ourselves every day, analyze ourselves, and to tell ourselves on a daily basis, it's not our will, it's your will. Whatever life brings, whatever life throws at us, it's your will, Father. Help us to be your servant every day. Help us to think about being your servant every day. We pray for the church here, pray for the church world over. Father, we have special heavy hearts as we see society uh, become hardened to Christians, the treatment of Christians, and the ability to, to worship here tonight without fear or harm. 
We pray for your guidance. We pray for your security. Help us to continue to spread your word as much as possible. Father, we pray for those that Brother Larry mentioned are sick, that perhaps can't be with us or have ailments. Please be with them. Uh, be with the doctors that attend to them and families that take care of them. Be with our Brother David tonight and deliver our lesson. We pray that uh, we may take this first day of the week to make a new commitment every day to be a better Christian. These blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Opening song tonight, number 217. 217. <clears throat> There's a call comes ringing over the rest way.
you'd like to mark the invitation song for tonight, number 595. 595. The song before the lesson, number 268. 268. If you would, please stand. <clears throat> There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the King. As an ensign fair we lift it up today, while the ransomed ones we sing. Marching on and on, marching on and on, for Christ counts everything. We'll be passing out some pamphlets that we'll all be filling out together this evening. And while you're doing it, I'll be searching for our, our uh, clicker. What happens when you have a ladies' day? <laughs> Christy Fletcher said everything's got to be off the front row. He was, <laughs> I'm not so sure. Didn't you? Didn't you say that, Christy? Wednesday night. She was. She was. Uh, she was making that well known. So. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Ashley came up and handed me this. It's a nice looking ring found in the ladies' uh, restroom. So uh, I'm going to lay this up here. If you do not have something to write with, then look around. Uh, if you see a lady with a purse, she's probably, she is probably going to have something in there. We'll make sure we have a great number of pins this time next week.
these booklets that we're filling out are a result of um, our workshop this past uh, weekend with Brother Rob Whitaker. This is a method of leading someone uh, to Christ. And there are many of these, and I have used these. I've also used uh, several other kinds, and they're all good. But we've got to have a method. As we get uh, started, think about two things. Um, and we'll repeat this before we extend the invitation, but think about God's view of you and how you view yourself. We are all leaders. All Christians are leaders. Jesus made this plain in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If you can lead someone to glorify God who is in heaven, then you are a leader. And that's what Jesus expects of us. All Christians are leaders. And all, all Christians are fishermen. Jesus wants to make us fishers of men, Mark 1, 16 and 17. Where do you go to fish? As Brother Rob mentioned the other day, we don't go to our aquarium to fish. Can you imagine someone going out and buying the proper equipment to go fishing and then they go to their living room and find their aquarium, aquarium and then they drop their bait down in the aquarium and say, I'm going fishing? Uh, we go out into the world to go fishing. And so we're all fishermen. The second thing I'd like for you to think about is the devil. The devil. The devil doesn't want us doing this. The devil doesn't want anyone becoming a Christian. The devil does not want anyone opening up their Bibles. Okay. Luke chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Jesus explaining the parable of the sower. He said the first thing the devil's going to want to do is come into your heart. Once the, once the word enters your heart, he's going to try to come in some way or another and take that word out of your heart, lest you should believe and be saved. So he doesn't want anyone sharing the good news, and once the good news is brought to us, he wants to try very hard to get it out of our lives. When we get it, the devil is terrified. When it finally hits our hard skulls and we understand, well, what is this all about? The devil is terrified. <clears throat> and when we share the gospel, the devil is terrified, but God is glorified. Bear that in mind. The devil is terrified. We're going to be edified, but God is glorified. That's what we want to do. We want to bring glory to God. Jesus says in John 15 and verse 8, all those who bear fruit for him bring glory to the Father. And so let's think about this pretty seriously. Why are we going over this method? Okay. You remember that Psalm 19, 7 and 8 says, the law, of the, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There's power in the Word. In fact, the only power that can bring us to God and bring us out of sin is the Word of God. That's why we're doing this. Getting into the Word of God brings one face to face with God. And Paul says in Acts 20 and 32, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are sanctified. It brings us face to face with God. But we're not going to share the Word unless we have a method. We've got to have it. It just doesn't happen. And unless we know how to use that tool, that method, then we won't ever use it. And if we have a method, then it keeps us from chasing things. They call it, you know, chasing rabbits or getting into just simply Bible trivia or getting into debates or arguments. We don't want to do that. We just want to learn the scriptures. And so you've got your booklet there, and let's get started. And this is going to be a very simple, just... We'll read the verse, and then we'll fill out the answer, the blank, that is provided next to the verse. And this is, this is what you will do when you're studying with someone. Okay. Say very little, just read the passage together, fill in the blank, and then just move on from there. I don't know else how to do this other than just how I have done it, and so that's how I'm going 
uh, to do it. Okay. So there's your booklets, and so we're going to move through that, and that's useless there, and that we're not going to do that, and uh, not going to do that. So. This is a problem with preachers. I don't know how to get down to the nitty gritty here. Uh, Brother Rob sent this PowerPoint to us. So, uh, bless his heart. All right. This first booklet is going to focus on what I call, he calls it here the map, of, map to Revelation, the chain of truth or chain of authority. The first section of this booklet will be the fact that Jesus' words are the truth. And then the second part of the booklet will be Jesus guided, or at least had the Holy Spirit uh, to guide the apostles into all the truth. And then when the apostles and others uh, wrote down these scriptures, then God's authority and truth is in the scriptures. And then the next part of the booklet will be we are not to add to or take away uh, from these uh, scriptures, the truth, and then finally, under which law do we uh, live under today? So I'm not sure how far we'll get in all that, but uh, this is the direction uh, that we'll be going. Okay. All right. Um, here we go. John 8, uh, 31 and 32, you might recall Jesus saying these words, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So in this first blank there, Jesus says the blank will make you free. What's the answer to that? Truth. Good. In John chapter 4, Jesus talking to the woman in Samaria at Jacob's well. They had discussed many things, but uh, they got down to the subject of worship. And in John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so Jesus, in filling in this blank, Jesus tells us that we must worship God in spirit and in what? Truth. Good. John 17 and verse 17, this is Jesus' prayer to the Father. Somewhere between, you know, he's in Jerusalem for the final time, somewhere in between the meeting in the upper room, and Jesus going to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he led this prayer. He said this prayer. Okay. And so in John 17, 17, he's talking about how that the disciples were going to be called out of the world, in the world, but not of the world. And so that took uh, sanctifying them. So he prays to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay. So real simple here, what is truth according to John 17, 17? The word of Jesus, the word of God uh, is truth. Turn your Bibles now to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Of course, you would not go uh, this fast at all. As we're, we're in a group setting and you have the pamphlet before you and you have your, your pen or, or pencil and so we can move. But here, uh, you would move on and you would you want to make sure that... You relate who's doing the talking here. Okay. So in these passages so far, it's been Jesus during his lifetime on earth. So you want to kind of set up the idea of the context a little bit. And you can't get too detailed about that. But you certainly want them to know uh, who is doing the speaking. And kind of sometimes it's, it's proper to go ahead and explain the situation that's going on. Here in John 14, Jesus is most likely still in the upper room meeting with his disciples. And notice here in John 14, uh, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So notice this fill in the blank. The teaching of Jesus was from was from the Father. From the Father. Okay. And that's important because the truth begins with the Father and Jesus brings it to the earth and then he qualifies the apostles to have it and then the Spirit leads the apostles to write it down and now God has preserved that write, those writings for us uh, today. Okay. 
So the next passage is uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews uh, chapter 1. Notice this, the beginning of this epistle that was written to uh, Christians who had a Jewish background and who were being pressured uh, to go back to the old Mosaical law. They were receiving a lot of pressure in those days to do that. Notice how this epistle begins. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom also uh, he created the world. So simply today God speaks to us through, through the son, through his son, through his son. Running back now to John uh, chapter 3. Interesting, this is not Jesus speaking, I don't believe, if I remember right. This will be John the Baptist uh, speaking about uh, Jesus. John chapter 3. Picking up along about verse uh, 34. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, John three thirty-five, and has given all things into his hands. See that? John 3, uh, 35. And so God has given what things into the hands of Jesus? All things. All things into the hands of Jesus. And so as you're reading scripture together and you're there at your table and you're one side and, and uh, the one you're studying with is on the other side, you're just simply reading these passages and filling out uh, the blanks. A familiar passage uh, since John says that the Father has given all things into the hands of Jesus. Then this next passage is very appropriate. Matthew 28, 18. As Jesus begins to give the Great Commission. You remember this very well. He says, All power or all authority has been given unto me, unto me in heaven and on earth. So Matthew 28, 28 18. The question is, Jesus has all blank in heaven and earth. Okay, all authority, all power. And then back to Jesus' prayer there in John chapter uh, 17. I love this little verse here. Uh, Jesus had just talked about it as he began his prayer. Father, the hour has come. Glorify uh, your son that, the, that your son may also glorify you. And then notice John 17 and verse number 2. John 17, verse 2. Since you have given him, the Son, Father, since you have given the Son authority over all flesh, so that he can give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So, here in the blank, John 17, verse 2, Jesus has authority over all flesh. All flesh. All right, so here comes uh, the answer. You can check those. Okay. And going back to God's um, map of Revelation there and then uh, bringing out the answer. Now moving on, um, still thinking about the fact that Jesus has all authority and his authority is in the words that he speaks. Let's run over now to Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's epistle to the church in, in Ephesus. And Paul has a special prayer that he's praying for them. As you look down here to the latter part of Ephesians uh, 1, you, you'll decide what you say as you go over to this passage that you You'll be talking as you're turning to the passages with someone. Then you'll want to say something like, well, Paul was in prison and he's writing this to the Christians in Ephesus. You know, there are, there are a lot of folks that when they see Ephesians, if you see Colossians, they have no idea what, what is that word about, you know. But if, once you explain, hey, that's a city and that he's writing to the Christians in that city and you're saying that as you turn over to uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 1, and then picking up in verse uh, 20, Paul had prayed that they would have great spiritual knowledge and understand these things about Jesus. 
Ephesians 1 beginning in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the, at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this life but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay. So that passage teaches these things. Notice this. God has made Jesus to be head over all things to the what? To the church. Does this mean Jesus has all authority over the church? Now, heading back to John chapter 12. A lot of these passages, especially passages about Jesus' authority, comes from John. I think that was one of the main purposes of John's uh, biography of Jesus, was to show that uh, he is the Son of God, and that he, has, uh, he is the Son, and that he has this authority from the Father. <coughs> John chapter 12, Jesus has made his entrance into Jerusalem, but he has not gone to the upper room. You see John 13, that's when they go to the upper room and Jesus washes the disciples' feet. But in between uh, those two things, uh, Jesus has opportunity to talk to uh, his disciples and to the Jewish people. So in John 12, 48, he says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my sayings or my words has one who judges him. The word that I have spoken unto you will judge uh, him on the last day. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So notice in John 12, 48, at judgment we will be judged by the words of who? Jesus. Looking over to John chapter 6, Jesus had, he had walked on water by this time in John 6, 68. And on the western side of the Sea of Capernaum, he began to have discussions about who he was. Many who were hearing his sayings decided not to follow him anymore. If you look at that in uh, John 6, 66. But then Peter, Jesus looked to Peter and said, Do you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? John 6, 68. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so, who has the words of eternal life according to John 6, 68? Jesus. Should we go to anyone else? Parents, preachers, relatives, friends, for eternal life? Okay, very good question asked um, there. Okay, so the first section of the booklet there covers these verses that establishes that Jesus has the words of eternal life, God has placed all authority into uh, his hands. Okay. So the next session, next section is the fact that Jesus promises the apostles, he chooses the apostles, and he promises that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all the truth. So let's notice this reading from John chapter 14 and verse 26. Most uh, people who make commentary say that at the end of chapter 14 in John, Jesus leaves the upper room and heads to the, to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. So in John 14, he's still talking in the upper room to his disciples. Beginning in verse 25, These things have I spoken to you while I was yet with you, but the, uh, the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, notice this, and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have said unto you. The apostles were simply men, just like you and I. They would certainly need help to remember all that Jesus had said and done, and then also they would need help in the future to teach what needs to be taught. Similar passage in John chapter 16 and verse uh, 13. John 16 verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you uh, things to come. All right? 
So notice this from John 14, and the fill in the blanks here. Did Jesus say the Holy Spirit would teach them all things and bring all that Jesus said uh, to their remembrance? Did he do that? Okay. Yes. And when the apostles taught by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were they teaching their own words or the words of Jesus? Or to Jesus. Very important distinction uh, made there. They were not teaching of their own. Not a, not a single apostle would ever say, this is, this is my own thoughts and words. John 16, 13, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into 50% of the truth? Okay. So that's a little thing that uh, when Jerry Jenkins uh, works through his pamphlet, he will often stop right there and he will have a little question to say, did Jesus say 50%? Did Jesus say 80%? And so, into all uh, the truth. And then, in addition to this, uh, looking over to Jude, as Jude uh, begins the verse, in verse 3, he says his desire was that he would just write to them concerning the common salvation. But it, that was necessary that he change his mind and write to earnestly plead with them, to earnestly uh, contend for the faith, which was once for all time delivered to the saints. Notice that in Jude, verse 3. Okay. He said, It was necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So notice this question uh, in regard to that. Was the faith delivered in the lifetime of the apostles? Was it delivered? Now, when he says the faith here, he's talking about the truth. He's talking about uh, the words of Jesus. Okay. And so, read it. that's the way we should read it. Was the truth or was the faith delivered in the lifetime of the apostles? Was it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. How much of it? All of it. That's very important to establish that early on as we are seeking to lead someone uh, to the Lord. So here we're going to review and make sure we have all the answers uh, correctly. Church, yes, Jesus, and then the Lord we should not follow. Uh, and so he keeps reminding us that we're working through this chain or this map of authority or revelation. So it started with the Father and then to the Son. And then... Uh, Filling in again uh, these blanks, just to make sure we have them all. all right. Now one question before we move to the next section, based on what we've been reading. Since the apostles were guided into all religious truth in their lifetime, should we expect to receive any new revelation today? No. That's one of those times when, when these kinds of questions are given, that's a good time to just stop and be silent a moment. Okay. So we want that to, to sink in. Right? We, want, we want that to, to be an impression that is made. That's what all these verses are about, is the fact that it's all been delivered. It's all been delivered. We must go back to the Bible uh, to see our way to find our way uh, to the truth and to uh, the Lord. Okay. So the next section is that what they wrote down uh, was inspired and is now our only guide in religion uh, today. And these ideals begin in John chapter 20 where John gives the whole purpose of his uh, biography. He says... These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life uh, in his name. So notice the blanks that ought to be filled in here in John 20. These things are written that you might do what? Believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you might have what? All right, that you might have eternal life uh, in his name, life in his name. One of our favorite little verses is found in, also in 1 John 5 and 13. 1 John 5 and 13. 
The Lord doesn't want us to walk walking around with a, with a cloud of doubt over us. If we know the Lord, if we know His truth, and we are submitting to His truth, then notice what John says. 1 John 5, 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. These things are written, brethren, those of you who believe, these things are written so that you may know. So notice the blanks there. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5 and 13. Someone tell me, what does Romans 10 say? 10, 17 say? All right. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And so knowing that, how does faith come? That question is. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Heard the word of Christ. Right. Now turning in your Bibles, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And oftentimes, as you are uh, reading the script, these scriptures and going through these uh, pamphlets with someone, it will be necessary to help them find the scriptures. And that's okay. That's okay. Someone had to help us find the scriptures. And so we, we in turn want to help someone else find, find their way in scripture. Okay. So you, all you simply have to do is say, hey, go back to the back of your New Testament or, or jump back toward the front of your New Testament and um, they, they find it no problem. So in James chapter 1, notice James' words in verse 21. Therefore, putting away all filthiness and King James says superfluity of naughtiness. Okay. Uh, ESV says rampant wickedness putting all that away so that you can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. James 1.21 then, what is it that is able to save your soul? Okay. The engrafted word, the implanted word, the word that's planted in your heart will lead to uh, your salvation. Okay. Just a few pages over, and you love it when this happens, when the scriptures are close together then uh, you can make some progress as you're studying uh, these principles. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, I like to read 22 and 23 together. Notice 1 Peter 1, 22, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, Unto a sincere or unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then verse 23, since you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, through the living and abiding word of God. So notice this from our pamphlet. How is one born again? According to 1 Peter 1, 23, how is one born again? Right. That's right. Through the word of God, through the living and abiding word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23. So, follow-up question to that. Should you go to any other source to learn how to be saved? Yeah. There's no need for that. There's no need for that. And that's the... That's the um, cruelty that's in the world, that's the tragedy that we face in the world is that so many have gone others to other sources. So following 1 Peter 1, we're still in the section of the fact that what the apostles and others wrote down were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So they've been preserved for us today and so they are the only guide in religion today. So in thinking about that, Look back to 2 Timothy in your Bibles. In chapter 3 this time, familiar verse to us. Paul encourages a young man. And you'll want to do that because sometimes the books are written to a single individual. Sometimes to a church. Okay, sometimes to just 
the world in general, like the Gospel of John. But uh, notice here, Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, 3, beginning in verse uh, 16. All Scripture is uh, given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be, what does your verse say there? Thoroughly furnished, uh, completely complete, okay. uh, thoroughly furnished, maybe uh, perfect, thoroughly furnished for every good work, equipped for every good work. So notice the questions here. Does the Bible thoroughly furnish us unto every good work? It is sufficient for that. Do we need additional revelation to make us complete before God? There's wonderful emphasis made uh, in these passages. Right, here comes this. Again, the chain of authority put up here. God the Father. And then he sent his son to the earth. His son has all the truth. The Son sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles to guide them into all the truth. And then eventually the apostles wrote down the truth and we have it uh, today. Notice this, another follow-up follow -up question. Uh, since the apostles were guided into all religious truth in their lifetime, should we expect... Um, we already got that number. Just more answers, okay. I wouldn't do it this way. Once I'm done with the page, I'm done with the page. Just different folks do it different ways. I knew there was a follow-up question to this. Uh, do we need the Book of Mormon to make us complete spiritually? Hit it now. Do we need uh, church traditions, manuals, creed books, confessions of faith to make us complete spiritually? So let's see. That works. Okay. <laughs> Second Peter 1, verse 3, has a similar emphasis. Remember, you want to keep the uh, emphasis not on you, not on you, but on the scriptures. Okay, no matter how inept you are using a PowerPoint. <laughs> Second Peter one three, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Again, the word all just keeps showing up again and again. His divine power has granted to us, Peter speaking there, as an apostle, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That pretty much covers what we need to cover. And then through the knowledge of him who's called us to his own glory and virtue. And so, notice this. Has God given us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Okay. That would be a yes. Since God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness in the Bible, should any other source be used as our religious authority? Very good. Very good. Right. I have no clock before me. How we how we doing? Ten to. Are you doing okay right now? Can we go five more minutes? Okay. I think you're doing okay. So I'm going to go five more minutes. I got absolutely no response from that. <laughs> right. There are two more sections in the pamphlet. Okay. There is the idea of we don't need to add two since, since God has given these words. And preserve them for us. We don't need to add to or take away. 
And then finally, under which law do we live? Which law do we live? One question that can be asked that kind of gets your attention is this. Do we have to obey every command in the Bible to please God? Do we have to obey every command in the Bible to please God? The answer to that is no, because we don't live under the old law. A lot of commands under the old law. A lot of commands under the old patriarchal system. God told Noah to build an ark for the saving of his house. God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah. A lot of commands that are given throughout the Bible, but only those in the New Testament, under the new covenant and new law, pertain to our life and godliness today. So we'll let that uh, bring us to a close. Next Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll start right there, finish up, and then we'll also pass out uh, booklet number two. And we will uh, make our way through the... The ideal here is that you and I can sit down with someone and do this very same thing. And we just let the, the words of Paul, the words of Jesus, the words of James, and the words of Peter, we let them do the talking. And that's the way it's supposed to be. This morning in our a teen class, we were studying um, John the Baptist. And it was predicted that he would be a voice crying in the wilderness. His, his responsibility was to prepare the way for the Lord. But John was just a voice. We can be a voice for the Lord as well. No matter who we are. Look how John looked. John, John wearing camel's hair and, and taking locusts and dipping them in, in honey and li he lived off the land. And yet look at the powerful influence he was for the Lord. We don't have to be anybody, you know, religiously special. God wants his people, all of us, to, to just sit down and share the good news with others. That's what these pamphlets and what the, that's what this method is all about. Let's go back to the first couple of questions. How does God view you? And how are you doing against the devil? How does God view you? And how, how are you doing against the devil? The devil doesn't want any of this to happen. But Jesus prepares us. 1 John 2, 15 and 17, all that's in the world the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, those are the things the devil uses, uses, us, uses against us to take us down, to take us away from the Lord. We must be ready to do his will, submit to him, give other things up so that we can make sure others have the opportunity to hear the gospel. How are you doing against Satan? And then the question, how do you view yourself? Every day we get up, we have a view of ourselves, who we are. We're just Christians. And as Christians, the Lord says, I want you to be fishermen. I want you to be leaders in the land. I want you to let your light shine brightly. I want you to lead others to me so they can glorify my name as well. And so with these thoughts in mind, let's think about our own life. Where do you stand? And how are you doing against Satan? He still is the old serpent. And he slithers around. But we can fight him. And we have the tool to do it. We have the word of God. A long time ago, the psalmist said... Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. We invite you this evening. If you, if you believe in the authority of Jesus, you believe that he is the Son of God, you believe the, the Bible is his word, then you're in a great position 
to turn from your sin, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be immersed in water for the remission of sins. And as Jeff illustrated this morning, he just he's, he's been a Christian for years, years. But he, as as followers of God, we have our struggles. We have our burden. We have our weaknesses. Sometimes we get off track. Sometimes we disappoint God and ourselves and maybe our families and friends. But God has, through His Son, through His mercy, He gives us the opportunity to come back to Him, pray, and we can receive forgiveness. Won't you come home right now as we stand together and as we sing? God is calling the this uh, concluding song. Please uh, remember the Lord's Supper has been left prepared in our conference room right off the foyer back there. Please make your way there if you need to partake of that uh, this evening. Um, Larry's already mentioned the food that's um, back there left uh, from Ladies' Day yesterday. Please uh, come on back and help yourself uh, to any of the, uh, of the good food and snacks and desserts. There's a lot of desserts back there. So uh, Pay attention to that as you go back there. So remember our group meetings. Uh, one will take place here in the auditorium, one in the classroom right off the foyer. Remember the ring If you did not have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning and it's been left prepared in the meeting room, out in the foyer, just go through the double doors and hang a left and there'll be someone there to assist you.
Closing song tonight, number 282, 282. <clears throat> How firm a foundation ye saints of old Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, you move unto Father in heaven, thank you for this Lord's Day you've blessed us with, the times that we've been able to come together and study another portion of your word and sing praises unto your high and holy name. Father, please help us to take the lessons that have been prepared today and presented to us that we may apply them to our everyday walks of life and not only to our lives but help to show others in their lives that you are the way. Father, please be with the sick. Those of our number who have had surgeries, uh, those that are in hospitals, please be with them, help them, be thy will to return their much wanted health. Please be with those who have lost loved ones, comfort them in their time of need. Father, please be with the elders as they oversee our flock, the flock here at Midway. Pray that you bless them and, and guide them in all uh, the direction of your word. Father, please be with those who are on foreign souls as they uh, proclaim your gospel and try to spread the borders of your kingdom. Pray, pray to bless them as they're away from their families and return them when their time is, is done. And, and if they go back, please help them to have a safe trip. Father, thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth and died a cruel death that we may have forgiveness for our sins. And we pray that you would forgive us for our sins because we often say, do, and think things that are unaccordant to your work, unto your will. Please bring us back to the next point of time. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> 